Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Over the past half century, more than 85,000 industrial chemicals have been registered in the United States. In Europe, more than 1,300 chemicals are banned from use in the form of lotions, soaps, toothpaste, cosmetics, and other personal care products. Contrast that to the US where just 11 are banned. Environmental toxins have been linked to obesity, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, cataracts, and cancer. Today's guest, Dr. Shanghang Lu, MD, PhD, specializes in environmental medicine. Dr. Lu has, has practiced integrative medicine for over 20 years. Dr. Lu lectures extensively to other physicians and is the medical director of Ananda Integrative Medicine in Mount Shasta, California. Dr. Lu, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Kerry. It's so great to team up with a physician specializing in the eyes because the eyes are the access of many toxins. Thank you. So, Dr. Lu, what is environmental? What is environmental medicine, and one, why does environmental toxins cause mysterious, hard to diagnose diseases? Environmental medicine, uh, this particular group called American Academy of Environmental Medicine actually was founded 55 years ago. And it's a specialty of physicians who are looking at very complex um, autoimmune allergy issues that people have to their environment. And they actually started in Chicago. And the reason um, they're a very special group is instead of treating the symptoms, they are looking for the cause. And th at that time, you know, 55 years ago, um, very few were relatively, uh, you know, very, uh, not very common, rare cases are clearly environmentally related. And, but later on with the development of chemicals, especially in agriculture, in forest care, in road care, in our daily life, we become, uh, the environmental disease is contributing to 80% of the chronic diseases. Obesity, the ever-growing obesity, is really a symptom of our body's way to put away the toxins. And I have seen this many, many times because in the, in the past, when people are overweight, they're probably eating too rich food, you know, drink too much beer, not exercising, right? Which is clearly a reason. But lately I'm seeing skinny people, skinny vegans, healthy people having cancer, having autoimmune disease, mental issues, right? Brain fog, hair fallout. And I suddenly realized, wait a minute, the overweight and obesity is really a sign that environmental toxins are being stored in the non-vital organ, which is the fat. But for those people who do not have the capacity or genetics to be fat, those people actually have more serious disease in their vital organs, which is the bone marrow and the brain. In women, is the breast. Breasts are organs of fatty tissue. And oftentimes they absorb more toxins than the rest of the woman's body. So I have been working with Breast Cancer Foundation, Breast Cancer Fund, which is a group of women. They're all mountain climbers. They're athletes. They're at their best time in their 40s having aggressive breast cancer. So these group of women actually become extremely devoted and focused on eliminating, identifying first, and eliminating the environmental cause of breast cancer so that's really the long explanation of what environmental medicine is. 
environmental medicine is to looking for the cause of the disease. Looking for the cause will prevent, right? Offer the, the possibility of preventing the future degradation of human health. And in the big picture is really destroying destruction of the planet health and which we all love. This beautiful little planet is pristine. It's just a beautiful place for life to thrive for, for the bio, biodiversity, right? Right now we're seeing monocropping, we're seeing the diseased nation and the diseased planet. And I travel internationally to many places and I'm watching the slow decay by this industrialization of beautiful places. So um, my passion is really advocate for environmental health and I know how difficult it is, right? I, I, I met many, many pioneers in this area. Dr. Peter Meyer uh, wrote a book, Our Stolen Future in the 90s. And I think that the, the reluctance of people making this you know, contribution or commitment is because they don't make the connections. As a medical doctor, when I started testing people's toxic burden, they suddenly are making connections. For example, if somebody have cancer, you know, instead of saying, oh, if you have cancer, that's too bad, you know, and you have to go through the chemo, I said, let's take a break. Let's look at what toxins you have been exposed in your lifetime and what your body still have, which is a simple urine test. It's now costing only $290 instead of thousands of dollars. And people have an opportunity to look for the cause. Once they define the cause, we can detoxify, personalize a detox program, which is basically made of two ways. One of them is decrease exposure. If you have a car, no gasoline leak in your car and, and emitting MTBE, which causing brain tumor, we need to fix the car. We need to get rid of the exposure. You know, that's really getting rid of the exposure and a systemic detox program that everyone can do. And it's affordable. People can do it every day consistently. What happens is the body will begin to heal. This is the part people don't understand. People are losing hope, um, said the body won't heal. Well, we have stage four cancer patient continue to live their life because they now are getting rid of the carcinogens. You see, we're now treating the cancer. We're getting rid of the cause. We must have faith that our body has the intuitive ability to heal. This is the part that we as medical doctors, sometimes we like to play God, right? We give you a magic pill. We give you a magic solution, but we forgot who heal the body. Eventually, is the body's immune system, the body's hormonal neuroendocrine system sending the right signal to the body. The body will heal. Now, heal doesn't mean, you know, have no diagnosis. Heal just means living a great life until the very end. Do you see? So focusing on living a great life is becoming the goal. Allow the body to self-regulate. That's Does a great sense? introduction uh, of what we're going to talk about. We want to break down all those points that you spoke about. Now, is environmental medicine something that is taught in, in medical school today? And be, it's, it's not taught in medical school. Why isn't it taught? Because the medical school um, is, today's medical school are heavily funded by pharmaceuticals, uh, surgical equipment. Um, you know, most of the medical uh, school are focusing on diagnosing and treating the disease, which I, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just a Western medicine philosophy, okay? I grew up in China. My mother is a cardiologist. She's 92 years old. Uh, my grandmother was a Chinese medicine doctor. So I grew up in this two culture, the conventional medicine, Western medicine, focusing on diagnosing, 
early diagnose, early intervention, and they focus on the disease, do you see? So when you focus on disease, environmental medicine is becoming out of the paradigm, do you see? Uh, so that's one reason. But I also think the rapid growing of chemical pollution, electromagnetic pollution, um, and, and a heavy metal. Heavy metal has been around for a long time. But the most chemical pollution and the electromagnetic pollution have been just happening in the past 10 to 20 years. And I want you to know most of the medical book are about 30 years out of date. Okay? So it's really a systemic problem. The system is very difficult to change. You see? So environmental medicine is even more you know, obvious. They have an old branch called um, toxicology, okay? So there is a training about toxicology, overdose on chemicals and heavy metals. But those are, again, is acute exposure. Now the profound the chronic exposure and, and to, you know, to, to actually have a department or textbook to, to teach medical students, do you see? So there's a sluggishness of the medical education system, the new onset of massive pollution, these two does not match very well, doesn't it, right? So that's why environmental medicine attract initially the functional medicine doctor, the hormone doctors, the anti-aging doctors, because we are the one looking for the root cause of rapid aging. I really got started with anti-aging medicine because I want to stay healthy and young like my grandmother did, right? She passed away at, that, at age 96. She learned English at age 86. So I want to be healthy until the end. I just don't want to slowly dying, you know? So that's where environmental medicine attracted a lot of out-of-box thinkers. And now I do believe, I spoke to Dr. Adrian Sprouse, uh, she is a great environmental medicine doctor. You should interview her. Um, she's 75 years old. She said, Dr. Liu, the 21st century medicine is environmental medicine. If you believe that, you are going to see the unfolding of this profession. You're an, ex you're an expert in neurodegenerative diseases. Explain what a neurodegenerative disease is, and let's take Parkinson's for an example. Yes, very good. Um, I think one thing I love the neurodegenerative diseases is because you can't transplant the brain. <laughs> so, you know, we see a lot of chronic kidney disease, diabetes, high blood pressure. Uh, we, we transplant everything, right? We really cannot transplant the brain. The brain. So neurodegenerative disease uh, in the old time, you know, 20, 30 years ago in medical book, is considered part of the aging. So brain atrophies, we're losing the trophic factors, we're losing hormones, um, you know, the brain start to shrink. And now we develop a shrinking disease, right? Atrophy disease, and which is Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, and some of the neuropathy that they call idiopathic peripheral neuropathy many of them are considered part of aging. But what's really alarming is we're seeing younger and younger people coming down with neurodegenerative disease. Um, initially, I found a group of people with a brain injury, you know, traumatic brain injury. Those people tend to have atrophy earlier because they damage the master gland of the pituitary gland. So the hormones start to decline and they start having brain aging. But very, very quickly though, I found people with environmental exposures exhibit brain irritation first. So many, many um, Parkinson's patients, the reason I love Parkinson's patients is every single one of them actually have a very clear head, okay? They actually know what they want to do, what they want to say, they just can't do it. They're living in the, in the basically prison of their self, okay? That type of suffering is absolutely um, tremendous. You know, I, I, I feel 
um, when you see people want to do things, they used to be athletes, they used to be, you know, so vibrant, and suddenly they're losing the vitality um, and losing the simple control of simple things, you know, like drinking a cup of coffee, writing a letter, you know, everything is, it's, it's out of control, especially the motor function is out of control. It's a very difficult situation to live with. Um, but neurodegenerative disease, another feature is progressive. It's very progressive. Um, natural treatment, you know, also is a maintenance treatment to say the best. If you do not define the underlying cause, these neurological diseases are very progressive and eventually people will go into a slow death mode. Um, they will be ending in a wheelchair for years and they are, you know, they really do not want to live. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we, we want to continue our life. So um, it really in, you know, affect the quality of life. Um, because I do believe, Carrie, everyone um, has the ability to live life fully. Um, neurodegenerative diseases are the worst way to spend a long time as human being alive on earth. So um, that's why I, I become very interested in learning the, the cause and hopefully we'll have ability to stop the progression. And if we treat it, you know, if we discover the cause early enough, we can prevent the progression altogether. That's really my goal, um, putting this environmental medicine piece in this, in this disease. The rate of Parkinson's has been doubling over the yep. last number of years. S explain some of the earliest signs and symptoms of somebody that's getting Parkinson's. Very good. So um, many patients actually know, um, sometimes it's usually start with one limp. And it could be just a feeling when they're walking, they're only swing one arm, okay? Something very minor, where they feel their right knee is not quite the same as the left knee. Like, like the, the, the right knee seems to give up or like out of control. A very minor could be a little tremor. Tremor actually um, is when they, when they drink coffee or get nervous and they found their, their hand tremors um, periodically, not all the time. Um, so those are very early signs of Parkinson's disease, okay? Uh, we, we, people would say, well, I had that for 10 years or, or for, for five years. Um, I'm a runner, suddenly I feel my, 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 my body is not coordinating, you know? Um, so those things are very common. Um, Parkinson's disease can also start with um, coordination. Like people say, I can't ride my bike with hands off. Like that's, I used to be able to do that all the time. Something fine, motor control, uh, riding, riding is a very good one. So, suddenly they see their, their, their riding is, you know, not very smooth. Uh, those could be all subtle signs. We need to catch that. Uh, because Parkinson's disease, by the time it's fully diagnosed, 80% of the dopamine-producing cell are already gone, okay? So that's why we, we want to save those cells which are dying, and, and, and there is a series of sequence of events we need to detect early. Um, so anyway, back to you. So... What's scaring me is in my practice, I'm starting to see young people getting Parkinson's disease. In the past, it was much older people. Now we're seeing younger people with neurodegenerative disease, such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and even stroke people are getting, are getting earlier. Why is that happening? Yes. So young people today uh, compare, uh, Carrie, how old are you? I'm 62. You're 62. So, um, so you and I actually are the baby boomers. Um, I mean, I was in China, so there's no such thing. But what I learned is after World War II, many of the weapon companies are, um, start producing chemicals from nitrates because there's an excessive amount of nitrates. 
and also petroleum product. So many of the plastic, the chemical industry start to put in a lot of the untested chemical in, into our life. So young people today, before they are born, they already carry up to 288 chemicals. Many of them are neurotoxins. These are babies who are not born yet. Do you see? And you and I, unfortunately, we're teenagers. We're preteen. So we also have a, the brain was developing, the body was developing. So we have more toxins exposed and affecting us much younger than our parents. Like my mother, World War II, she was already in her you know, 40s. So she was not experiencing the timing of the chemical exposure. Do you see? It's very, very critical. The reason we must jump on this is because the babies, you know, if you see the neurons growing every single second, they are much more prone to neurotoxins, do you see, than the two years old, than the four years old. So women, as a teenager, they are more sensitive to endocrine disrupting chemicals because they're, they're, you know, their ovaries are growing, they're having estrogen receptors made in the brain. You know, it's just a really the timing. So we now are seeing more and more young people in their 30s, 40s have Parkinson's and dementia is because they're exposed at a much early stage than their parents, you see, at a much critical development, developmental stage. Endocrine disrupting chemicals, give us some examples of what they are and what they do to people. Yes. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are usually petroleum byproduct. So um, the, the, the definition is it has the ability to either behave like the hormone or interrupt the hormone receptor availability or interfere with the hormone metabolism. Okay, so, that, so it, at least it will affect the production, the function and metabolism of the endocrine system. Now, endocrine system basically are hormones. When we, when, when we talk about hormone, we talk about testosterone, estrogen, thyroid, uh, human growth hormone, insulin. These are all hormones. Hormones, the reason is really important. Hormones work at a very low dose, okay? The endocrine disruptors work at much lower dose than the normal toxins. That's why toxicology is becoming out of date because they're looking at the high dose. Hormones actually work worse at low dose. One of the examples is tamoxifen. Uh, tamoxifen is a hormone. It's, a, it's an estrogen blocker, okay? Now, you heard of tamoxifen, right? Of it's course. used for breast cancer prevention. Now, they found out tamoxifen as a hormone disruptor at low dose, actually stimulate breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a, that's a classic pharmaceutical for you. If you're not taking the right dose, the high dose suppress the breast cancer. At low dose, it stimulate breast cancer. So think about all the hormone disruptors. The most common one, I will, I'll tell you a couple of them. The first one is called the BPA. You heard of BPA? Yes. Uh, yes. It's so based... it with plastic bottles. Yes, yes. BPA was discovered by a pharmaceutical company many, many years ago um, to be, they, they want to use it to treat menopausal symptoms, okay? So during the clinical trial, they found BPA caused gallbladder issues, breast overgrowth, you know, tumor of the fibroids of the animal. And they said, okay, we can't use this. So they give up. BPA somehow was discovered by the food packaging industry. Then they decided since it aligns the cans to prevent the rusting, uh, it's on the airplane receipt, you know, the air, air, air ticket uh, receipts, the very slippery, stuff 
those are all PPA. PPA are also uh, make the plastic hard. Okay, so if you have a plastic ball that is really soft, it doesn't have BPA. The BPA is make the plastic very hard. So oftentimes they are syringes, medical syringes. They are plastic bottles that's really hard. Okay, that's made the made the plastic hard. Now, when the kids are outside playing sports, they're playing with pl they they're drinking water out of plastic in the heat. What happens to the BPA or now it's BPB? I guess because that became illegal. Is that leaching into the water causing a problem for our children? Absolutely. BPA is one of the strongest estrogens in the world. So you know estrogen, what does estrogen do in a man's body? It stimulate, uh, in women too, it stimulate the fat cell to grow, to divide. So if you see a person that's really big, it's not just they have big fat cells, they also have more fat cells. So, so, so it's really a behave like a hormone. Now we also, you probably notice man boob phenomena. You see young boy can have breasts uh, due to estrogen dominance, but then you see older people like in their thirties and forties, you know, in the back, back, you know, 20 years ago when I first practiced medicine, I noticed uh, people that are alcoholics cannot metabolize estrogen. So they have, you know, they have the breast thing. But nowadays, young men in their 30s, 40s have breasts. So it's really, really important to understand because BPA actually have higher affinity to estrogen alpha receptor. It stimulates the proliferation of the breast, okay? And also fat. BPA also is contributed to the increase of fibroid tumor because it's also stimulating the estrogen receptor rich cells. BPA also was found to be related to type two diabetes because they interfere with the metabolism of insulin. And if you measure BPA in people's blood today, it's very easy. You can have their two labs measure BPA. What are the, name of, those what are the name of the labs? One of them is called the Vibrant America. Vibrant America. The second one is called Genova Diagnostic, and they are on the East Coast. Vibrant America is on the West Coast. Uh, Genova Diagnostic is on the East Coast. They take a urine from you, and they can measure how much BPA is in you. And what it's else will it measure? What other things will it measure besides BPA? What other environmental toxins can Vibrant and a GPL uh, measure? Okay. So Vibrant um, is a fantastic company. They do, they're a new company. They measure um, things like PCB. Have you heard of PCB? Sure. Um, PCB has been banned forever, for probably 40, 50 years. Um, because it's a forever chemical, it doesn't get biodegraded. It gets into the water and the land, and now it's in the ocean. So fish, I, I hope you don't like fish, I used to love fish. And then I learned the BP, uh, PCB is very, very high in fish, okay? And, and, and now we're eating the PCB from the fish. PCB is also a known cause of cancer. That's why they banned it. It's a known cause of endocrine disruption. Um, so PCB can be measured, uh, BPA can be measured. Another thing called the paraben. Paraben is uh, another chemical they put in the cosmetic, in plastic material, and it's also endocrine disruptor, especially in women. Uh, so that can be measured. And also um, phthalates. Phthalates are also contained in the plastic. It's a molding process. Remember, we have to put in the mold of the plastic thing and polymers and you know, make it like a plastic bottle. Phthalates are used in the process of making plastic material. Phthalates is also endocrine disruptor, and it can cause all kinds of feminization um, you know, in the body. Now, one of the biggest one that cause severe endocrine disruption is called atrazine. Have you heard of atrazine? Sure. 
atrazine is the second most used agricultural chemical next to glyphosate. Um, atrazine actually, they did experiment with two uh, a frog, you know, male frog and a female frog, right? And then they put the atrazine water, you know, give the frog. Now, they didn't give them a lot. They give the water that you can collect from a stream. Very low dosage. I can find the dosage for you, but very low. And they changed the male frog into a female frog. Okay? There's, and there's then the great, female- a great YouTube lecture by a professor who talks about atrazine. And he, he talks about how he was a little boy who loved frogs. <laughs> yes, yes, you see that one. It's, yes. uh, it's a very shocking. Sure. Yeah, so, and then that atrazine is in the water, and Dr. Pete Meyer has been contributing atrazine pollution to um, wildlife obesity. You know, the wildlife are actually getting fatter too. Um, also, the birds, the, their behavior, their mating behavior. Uh, sometimes you see two male are nesting, um, and he contributes atrazine to many of the male infertility and fem uh, femalization um, of the wildlife. So now, this, is, this is very concerning, right? Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. So does it happen the other way when females are drinking out of plastic? Are they becoming? Uh, are they be men <laughs> becoming like women? And are women becoming more like men? <laughs> um, actually, that's not as common. But there is a um, phenomena. There is a movie called "The Truth Behind Intersex." Have you ever heard of intersex? Okay. No. So intersex is, is babies are born with both female and male organ. And that's clearly a, the phenomena of, of uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals during their sexual organ development uh, in, vivo, in, vitro, in vivo in the body of the mom. And so some of the kids are developing with both organs, um, but it's, it's, very, it's becoming so common now in Washington, D.C., apparently, they're making bathroom that has intersex in the middle. So you have to watch the movie, The mm. Truth Behind Intersex. Uh, it's not, it's not heteros, you know, it's not homo, so, uh, homosexuality. It's actually the person have two organs. Hermaphrodite. Yes. So yes. now people being born with, this, with both sex organs compared now to how it was 50, 60 years ago. Are there any statistics on the difference? Yes, there is. And that is demonstrated in the movie. I see. So yeah. I assume it's a lot more now because of all the chemicals we're exposed to. The, yes. The, the average female puts on about 170 different chemicals on their body a day, and the average male, it's around 80 or so, right? Something like yes. that. Yes, yes. So, as far as as far as trying to avoid that, let's talk about avoiding it. First of all, the kids out playing ball and they're drinking out of these plastic bottles, whether it's plastic bottles made by a water company or from their house, should they be drinking out of glass? Would that be the best? Uh, the glass is great, except uh, it tend to break. Um, so we are trying to get a uh, good company called the Clean Canteen. Uh, that's actually a little company in Chico, California. Uh, they make the, the, the metal that is much more cleaner than, than, the, you know, than the plastic. Uh, but you want to make sure they tested the, the metal, make sure they, there's nothing that's really harmful come out of the metal. Um, it is a big challenge though, because I'm a bicyclist. Uh, we use plastic bottles. And uh, my husband told me, those plastic bottles used by cyclists do not have BPA, which I, you know, agree, but uh, to a degree because, but it's still plastic, do you see? So I think it's very important is to have a way to detoxify these plastics. 
because we can't avoid it. Uh, mm -hmm. We can limit it, but we can't really avoid it. If it doesn't have BPA, but could the phthalates be coming out and you be drinking that? And the thing about the metal, the metal canteens, sometimes mm -hmm. when you drink out of a metal canteen, the water tastes like metal. Yes, that's true. That's probably not the great metal. I see. So what yeah. is the what is a good metal to drink out of? Well, I think the, the company called Clean Canteen. Mm -hmm. uh, clean is is started with K. So K L E A N Canteen, uh, which is also K. So I think there are two K in there. Uh, they are actually approved by the Breast Cancer Fund uh, Foundation. Um, another place to look for safer plastic is EWG. So Environmental Working Group have a wonderful website that give people, consumers, uh, you just click, you know, cosmetic. You click um, even, even home refurnishing, you know, remodeling. They have a place to show you which product company carry less toxic stuff. Let's go back to the concept of estrogen dominance. For those that don't understand what that means, please explain that. Yes. Um, estrogen dominance doesn't mean the person have a lot of estrogen. It just means you compare to testosterone, compared to progesterone in women, there's a ratio. The estrogen become the, become, it became the, the dominant hormone. Now, estrogen dominant, estrogen is not bad. Estrogen is for life. Estrogen is for love, uh, helps serotonin. But the problem with estrogen, it, estrogen's main purpose is to make food, is to accumulate fuel to feed, to, uh, to grow and reproduce. Okay, just so, so philosophically, estrogen is really for getting enough food to go through winter, so you can have baby, so you can cre create, you know, maintain the baby's growth. The problem is estrogen can dominate the hormone system. So your testosterone, your progesterone are not able to have a good effect. Do you see? Because hormones are all in balance. You don't, have, you don't want to have too much thyroid. You know why? Because it will burn down your body. You need to have thyroid and growth hormone in balance so you are lean, but you are not losing muscle. Do you see? So right. hormones are, are done in, in pairs. Uh, insulin has glucagon, you know, in pairs. Insulin moves the sugar into the body, into the cell. Glucagon produces sugar and dump into the blood so you don't go into low blood level. Estrogen produces growth progesterone produce real baby fertilization, right? So this is, a, this is a very important balance. If you just have estrogen, you don't have progesterone, it doesn't work well. Um, the, the main issue with male, when you have too much estrogen, is they make the man fatter, they have more fat. Now man, in the male fatty tissue, there is, a, there is an enzyme called aromatase. So aromatase is produced in the fat. So when, when, let's say you have a normal testosterone level of 800, the aromatase in the fat will metabolize the testosterone into estrogen. Do you see? So male estrogen dominance is double whammy. Too much estrogen blocks the testosterone benefit. Too much estrogen also produces aromatase that will metabolize testosterone into estrogen. So that's so one of the reasons that the average male has much lower testosterone now than they did 50 years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the thing is this trend continued to get worse and worse and worse. And one of the reason I do believe is actually this glyphosate issue I want to mention today um, glyphosate is a multi-system destroyer. At a very low dose, they actually, again, studied the male rat, poor male rat, uh, they gave very low dose of glyphosate and have them drink it. They found those rats has testicular shrinkage, okay? Now, testicular, tes testicles are, 
the testosterone are produced. At a very, very low dose, glyphosate can inhibit the growth, normal growth and production of testosterone, um, the testicles of the rats. So, you know, unfortunately, our guys are the one out there spraying the weeds, right? Most people that are spraying the weeds, taking care of their lawn, taking care of their garden, are male. So, um, you know, it's just a, it's a very fascinating. Also, men are very interesting because they are invisible. When they're young, they are invisible. So uh, I've seen a lot of people that are spraying, and I, when I tell them this is very bad for their body, they're like, oh, Dr. Lu, I just have to take care of this long. Tomorrow, I'll know have, have, have no time. It just doesn't seem to connect with their brain. So um, let's interrupt for a second. For people yeah. who don't know where you find glyphosate, where is glyphosate? Where, where is it located? And how are people exposed to it? Okay, very good. Glyphosate is the main ingredient in 750 kinds of herb, herbicides. So I, you just go to a Home Depot where you guys have Lowe's or, um, you know, the, go to the garden department and they will give you Roundup, uh, uh, their, their Rodeo, different names, okay, for the herbicide. You pick up the bottle and you read the number one ingredient. That'll be glyphosate for you. So I would not use those if I, I mean, if people really want to, you know, take care of their lawn in an organic way, they do have more organic solutions now in most of the, even Costco have something called burned out. You know, they said organic gardening solution. Those are made of essential oils, lemon, vinegar, you know, they mix it for you. It actually worked really well. So if we look at, if we look at glyphosate, uh, tell us a story how glyphosate got started to where it is now and yes. how it's uh, become so ubiquitous. Yes, glyphosate is a, it initially discovered by a chemist in Japan. And that's before 1974, I believe in the 1960s. And he found out glyphosate is a really good pipe cleaner. It's a chelator. It tends to bind to the, all the minerals in the pipe. And so he said, oh, then we can use this chemical to clean the pipe. But meanwhile, uh, apparently he was very concerned because it's water soluble. The water soluble toxins are very difficult to take it back. Once you release in nature, it flows and it rains and it goes everywhere. So for some reason, he did not really uh, get into it or promote it. Um, and then the agriculture uh, chemical company, Monsanto, at that time, um, discovered it is a mineral chelator, so we can chelate the minerals of some wheat. So they patented it as a mineral chelator first. In 1974, it's patented as a wheat killer, okay, because it's like one of the best, you know, effective weed killing uh, chemical in the world. Uh, it become very popular, uh, not only among farmers, but also among the home keepers, gardeners, um, because they, you, you just spray on it, it's gone. And they had a Super Bowl commercial. I still couldn't find it in the 1980s. And they saw this man with the roundup on each pocket, came out of the garage, and there's a dandelion in, on the driveway, and he just, you know, boom, boom, and, and, and it shows the dandelion just gone. So that domestic use uh, is becoming very popular because people are very busy today. They don't have time to use labor, you know, weeding. So that's just the beginning of glyphosate. Glyphosate is really good to maintaining the ranches, you know, on the fence. They don't like to grow too much weed, so the, the cow ran into the fence. Um, and then they did a lot of the growing of the GMO food. GMO food, uh, like corn, cotton, alfalfa, soy, um, those are GMO food. GMO food are made to be resistant to glyphosate. Do you see? So 
you can grow a lot of them and kill everything else. This is where the biodiversity become to disappear. This is where we are very, very concerned, uh, Carrie, because when you go to a place, you want to see biodiversity. Biodiversity give you hope, give you appreciation of nature. Then you drive through, you know, from California to Chicago, you are going through the Midwest, what do you see? You Radical. see no bio, bio, biodiversity. It's a very concerning phenomenon. Now, so um, anyway, so back to you. what else was glyphosate used for, and what is it? What does it do? I mean, it, it works as an antibiotic, uh, chelator. Explain what it does, and then I want to bring it back to early Parkinson's and blood tests. Yes. So glyphosate uh, in the industry uh, mainly is, is used for weed control and as also growing GMO food. Glyphosate is also used to harvest legumes, grains, and even hops. Um, this is a very, very concerning practice because they dry, they dry the crops at the end of the season. When they spray it, that they kill the plants and then they harvest the grain right? Why that's so important? Well, because these food, these are the grain and the legumes and hops, you, they, they spray massive amount right before we consume it. So I just want you to know they are not only uh, used to control weed growing GMO food, but they are also used for harvesting. Very, very difficult, horrendous practice uh, and, and massively po poisoning the food. So now people will say, okay, what happened in our body? What does the glyphosate just, do? Just explain why they do it for harvesting again. They, it's called desiccation. They dry the leaves of the corn. Uh, have you seen the corn field? They, they want to just save the corn. They don't want the leaf because the leaf is too much work. Right. It's in so our they dry movie. the, right. They dry it much easier with a big machinery. So they, you know, nobody harvests with hand now. They just want everything to be uniform. So it's easily to separate the, uh, the, 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 the grain away from the leaves. You see? Mm -hmm. So it's agriculture, industrial agriculture practice, which is very devastating uh, to small farmers anyway. Um, so now we're exposed to the, glyphosate from our food, not just from our neighbors spraying, the water contamination. Now it's in every single food. Why? Because they use these food also feed animals. You see? And then we, you know, some people eat animals, so we, we, got, we got it anyway. So what does glyphosate do in the body? Number one, at very low doses, we, we talk about it causes DNA damage, it causes the testicular shrinkage. So it's actually a very strong endocrine disruptor. Glyphosate also metabolizes, uh, prevent the liver to do a better job to detoxify chemicals. So it's actually very, very important in controlling hormone metabolism. So it's, again, remember the endocrine disruptor either control the growing, the production of the hormone or block the receptor, or interfere with metabolism, the three features. Glyphosate has two of them, right? It shrinks the testicular cells, so you can produce testosterone. It actually influences the metabolism in the liver, so that can cause even more estrogen dominance, right? So very important. Glyphosate is patented as a mineral chelator. So if you talk to a lot of chiropractors, um, you know, chronic pain specialists, they will tell you almost every single person is deficient in minerals, especially magnesium, zinc, um, you know, cro uh, chromium, uh, molybdenum. Many, many of the minerals are depleted. Do you see? So that's second effect, endocrine disruptor, mineral depletion. Number three is actually, uh, it's antibiotic. It's patented as antibiotic. Now, it doesn't just kill everything. It kills mostly the friendly bacteria. It maintains a very disturbed microbiome in the gut. Clostridia species, 
are the one you probably heard of C. diff. It's a hospital acquired um, infection of the gut. But now we're seeing in the community, do you see? Very important to know glyphosate interfere with the gut. And we see so many physicians, they said, you know, Dr. Lu, I start with the gut. I ask them to start with the glyphosate because if you just give people the probiotic, what happened if they're still eating the glyphosate? The glyphosate is going to kill the probiotic. You're just wasting your money, right? So it's really important to focus on the root cause and continue to ask why. And I know that's kind of like a obsessive. I ask why a lot. You know, so how, do, how can we tell if we have glyphosate in our body? Uh, there's what kind a of test can we do? It's, there's, uh, there are four organizations now testing glyphosate, as far as I know. Um, one of them is called detoxproject.org. Detoxproject.org measure hair and urine of glyphosate and glyphosate metabolites. This company is an international company, so you can actually send samples to France, uh, to China, anywhere you want, okay? The second company called the HRI Labs uh, is in America. They also measure hair and uh, urine. They only look at glyphosate and some pesticides. The third company is the one I actually use quite a bit. It's Great, Great Plain Lab. Uh, they test urine, uh, $99 for the urine test. They also test your water. You can send in the water to the lab. Um, but they also measure 172 72 other chemicals at a much lower price. So um, I, I like Great Plain for their reason because they keep their testing very reasonable so more people can get tested. Um, so Great Plain, Vibrant uh, America is a brand new uh, young laboratory in California. They measure all environmental toxic burden in one urine. So even though they're a little more pricey, but they measure mold toxins also in, in their panel. So what four kind of, company. What kind of chronic diseases are associated with glyphosate? Um, so, <laughs> I know you're going to ask that. Um, glyphosate, since it's a systemic killer, is related to almost all chronic diseases, okay? Um, I want to start with neurodegenerative diseases because we actually have quite a few cases. Uh, the one, one case was a young man uh, tried to kill himself drinking Roundup, and he, you know, miraculously survived. One year later, he developed Parkinson's, okay, classic. Um, the other case is a woman. She accidentally massively exposed to um, Roundup. Well, actually glyphosate containing weed killer. We don't, we think, we don't name the brand. Um, but anyway, she developed pancreatitis first, acute pancreatitis. And then a year later, she developed classic Parkinson's disease, classic. So these are acute exposure, massive amount uh, related to you know, neurodegenerative disease, Parkinson's disease. Um, so that's one big one because uh, again, we, we, we want to point it out, these diseases have no treatment. There's no Western medicine treatment. The progression is devastating, okay? So that's number one. Number two, glyphosate would directly cause intestinal infection which we can probably relate. The massive increase of gluten intolerance, celiac sprue, uh, sensitivity to grain and legume. Those people are actually not sensitive to grain and legume. They are sensitive to the glyphosate that has been used. So that's the second group of disease is, is gastrointestinal disease. Okay, so that's two. Number three, uh, we must think about autoimmune disease. Because why? Because autoimmune disease is really a disease of the digestive system. If you look at 70, 80% of the immune system, it's under the epithelial cells of the intestinal lining. So uh, clearly, 
autoimmune diseases are related to glyphosate. Number four, respiratory illness, allergies, asthma. Why? Because glyphosate also can disrupt the tight junction of the epithelial cells, especially if you're inhaling into your, your, your lung right, regularly, you have very breakage, much breakage of the tight junctions that, that seal yourself away from the outside. Do you see? When glyphosate breaks those seals, anything you breathe in is going to be an allergen. So allergy is becoming an international pandemic. They found one out of four people in the world today have some type of allergy. Okay, so that's very concerning, right? How many people have allergies? So now we have digestive, neurological, we have the immune system, we have the allergy, asthma, the pulmonary diseases. Number five is chronic pain syndrome. Carrie, you are opt optometrist. I am an internist. Last year, the president announced national public health emergency because we lost 69,000 working people to opiate overdose. And the question is always why? And of course, they blame the pharmaceutical, manipulating the physicians. The physicians are prescribing too much painkillers. But the problem is, people have to go to the doctor, ask for the painkiller. Right. Like, like doctor, don't just, like, like you come in, uh, you don't feel so good, I'm, let me give you some opiates. That doesn't make sense, right? That indicated chronic pain syndrome have really accelerated. And the question is why? Well, glyphosate behave molecularly, molecularly look just like glycine with an extra phosphorus group. Glycine, you probably heard of glycine, is the key amino acid for collagens, connective tissue, for myosin in the muscle of the heart, for everything in the body. What glues the body together is like, it's, it's really the connective tissue. Connective tissue are mainly made with couple amino acids. Glycine is one of them, okay? So now we're losing the good amino acids. Thinking about you, you, you're making a building and all the bricks are beautiful and healthy. And then you have a couple bricks have a big chunk on it and you're trying to stick into the wall. What happened to the building? It's very brittle. It's very prone to fall apart. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing you have to remember. The other thing is when the protein are misfolded in such a way, it causes inflammatory reaction, right? The protein is no longer smoothly in aligned with the body. Inflammation becomes the secondary cause because the body's immune system said, look, there's a junkie guy there. We need to get rid of it. So now we're triggering autoimmune reactions. So chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia are the hallmark of an inflammation out of control. You see, and behind it is really the profound intoxication of glyphosate incorporation into these tissues. Okay, I spoke to an orthopedic surgeon. Um, he was mentioning about young people, their meniscus. Okay, if they damage the menis meniscus, normally you go in and repair them. You know, they're very strong. They they can just get a little surgery, take out the piece. Today, many of them, I'm now saying all of them, many of the meniscus, the surgeon tried to do a peeling and it breaks apart like an old person. So they have to end up removing the whole meniscus at a very young age. So they, they, they're discussing this phenomenon. They could, they, they're very, very perplexed, okay? Why is that? Because our tissue are no longer strong and resilient because the foreign amino acid is now inside our body. Does it make sense? Yeah, could that also be from too much sugar or too much uh, inflammatory oils? Uh, like in veterinary medicine, they give the animals oils to make their tendons and ligaments very floppy. 
uh, you know, that is uh, the, the, the initiation of the, the, the interest of our food uh, to the phenomenon of, of early aging, right? We, we said we just eat horrible food. I really do believe we eat horrible food. Um, I think the, the mechanism though is different. When you eat oil, rancid oil uh, and sugar, is your body become very acidic. When the body is acidic, you can't metabolize or detoxify the chemicals. Do you see? So it's really the detoxification problem then the food directly make your joint brittle. The food itself does not, there, there's no mechanism because our joints are made of collagens, right? We have connective tissue built in. There's no mechanism that the sugar itself, there's no experiment, the sugar itself will make the brittle joints. Do you see? Because we, we, we are talking about really the detoxification. People eating sugar, what's in the sugar? Well, do you know beets, sugar beets, are actually GMO food? So what is in the sugar is glyphosate. I'm telling you, I have a woman, she has type 2 diabetes, very skinny. She's a skinny type 2 diabetes, okay? And she said one time she just went to a, a restaurant, had a gluten-free buns, and they said they didn't put any, they, they probably did not put, they said they didn't put sugar, but they probably have sugar in it. And she had an anaphylaxis reaction. Her face swells up, okay? And you know that's not sugar. You know that is a chemical in the sugar. Right. Does it make sense? Sure. So sometimes you, 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 I started receiving a lot of email about, you know, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat that. I said, wait a minute. What's in the food is not what kind of food, it's what's in it. That people should ask. How about Boy. vitamins like vitamin C and sugar are very similar when they make vitamin C. Is there glyphosate in there? <laughs> That's a good one. Vitamin C are made from citrus. Um, and a certain type of citrus are from corn. Have you had a sweet corn? Sure. They are very high in vitamin C. So most of the supplement vitamin C are made from corn. You want to make sure they test it for glyphosate. Otherwise, people think they're allergic to citrus, you know, in the vitamin C, but it's actually they're allergic to glyphosate. Very interesting. Now, let me ask you about genetics. Certain people, they eat toxins or they are exposed to toxins and they could clear it. Other people hold on to their toxins. Can you explain the difference in those, difficult, those different types of SNPs that people have? Absolutely. So most people... Um, you know, luckily when toxin come in, I would say 80, 90% goes out through the liver. Okay. So when you, um, when, when they, when we have, um, let's say two people, they're both really healthy, eating alkaline diet, exercise, sweating, but one person do not have glutathione transferase and their production of the glutathione is half of the other guy. Okay. Um, so glutathione is a key intracellular amino acid uh, antioxidant, actually can conjugate the toxin. So that's one pretty common, um, not as common as methylation. Methylation is 30% of Americans, Hispanics, and Chinese have homozygous situation. And those means both of the gene that, that produce methylation enzymes are defective. Methylation is part of the phase two detox, but also part of the repairing and of the DNA. So it's an important biological function. And since it's very common, um, these people will have more sensitivity to toxins. So that's the second genetic. The first one is glutathione transferase. The second one is, um, is the uh, methylation. The third one, it's also, and it's, it's a antioxidant enzyme called the PONS. And antioxidant is a very important detoxifier. And most of the chemical come in 
and, and, and act on the mitochondria and produce oxidative stress. Antioxidant is really important to be produced to neutralize the, the damage. So many people can have antioxidant damage. My good example is actually my husband. Well, first of all, he grew up vegetarian, so he's super healthy. And I have a machine called Oligo Scan. I think uh, we talk about it. Um, so I can scan my hand for antioxidant, right? So it's always a competition because I take vitamin C, resveratrol, OPC. Uh, so when I compare to him, he doesn't take all this stuff. And he always have very good antioxidant level, um, very little oxidative stress, even though he looks, he stressed all the time, work all the time. So I feel very unfair. I feel like, what's wrong with me, you know? So when I did my genetic is I found I have antioxidant enzyme deficiency. I have some methylation issues, even though my, my glutathione is good. So you have to see if these two people have a genetic predisposition. You see, um, I do feel though, even they have perfect hand of gene, if they're massively exposed, they will still have disease it probably just a little later. It's just a matter of time, right? Um, so it's really something I learned. Um, Chairman Mao, you know, he smoked. Do you know who he smoked? He lived a very long life, right? Um, but if he smoked today, he's gonna die at age 60. Do you see? It's just we have more toxins today. So I want to thank Dr. Lou for joining me today for part one of our interview. In part two, we're going to talk about solutions. Uh, but Dr. Lou, before we go, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they find you? How can they get in touch with you, learn more about your work? Um, the best way is to email me. Um, so it's Dr. Lou at drlumd.com. Very simple. Thank you, Dr. Lu. Thank you for joining me on my Open Your Eyes podcast. Until next time, this is Dr. Kerry Gelb. Thank you for watching. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I like to bring extra, and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had safe for you to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with safe for you. And most importantly, the reason why I buy safe for you is because it's safe for me and you.